Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the World Council of Corporate Governance, Dr. Madhav Mecha. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you humbled, privileged, honored, and blessed to be in one of the most inspiring environments that one could ever imagine, or I could ever imagine, to be amongst the breathtaking and gasping ingenuity which this town and this country has produced at the cradle of the mankind. I am therefore humbled that you have given me the opportunity to address to this august audience on a subject which has been bedeviling the mankind from the very time the man actually came and started living in a community. And that is what I rate the importance of corporate governance. But when we talk about the ingenuity, what comes to my mind, unfortunately, is some of the, some of the visions of how humans have been able to misuse also their own ingenuity. That reminds me, the first time I actually happened to have come to the United Kingdom, I was staying in a place called Earl's Court. As you know, most of our towns have got certain areas which are inhabited by a certain group of people. As it happens in London, Earl's Court is in fact a hub of people who come from Australia. And as I used to visit sometime in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in a pub, I would meet a gentleman who was from Australia, but I wondered what he was doing. He would go to the barman, and he would ask for two glasses of scotch. Barmen, as you know, are very curious people. So the barman would say, he said, sir, why do you ask for two glasses of scotch? Why don't you take a double scotch? He said, no, I can't do that, because I come from Australia. You see, before I actually left Australia, I had a very close buddy. He said, you cannot leave Australia you will not lead Sydney unless you promise that whenever you drink, you will never drink alone. So I am taking two glasses because one is for me and another for my friend. Few weeks later, the man goes again to the barman. He says, one glass of scotch. So the barman asks him, sir, what happened to your friend? Has he died or something? He said, no, I have stopped drinking. That's for my friend. That is the degree of ingenuity which humanity has got. And what I'm going to talk about you that is what you see in the financial crisis of today. That is what has come up. Now, when we talk about the financial crisis, I have to just figure out the technology. There is a new order of law thing, as you see. Sorry, I have put doctors. I didn't mean to do that, you know, because doctors are doing a great job. Why should anybody blame doctors, you know? But when you see the bill, it's like a doctor who said, everything done, you're fine now. He took out both your intestines. So, sir, but I actually came in for a cataract operation. Oh my God, now you are again making excuses? You don't want to pay money. That's what happens, you see, because people have already thought that you are there, somebody, a sucker, who has to pay money to them. Forgive me if it's doctors. But you know, two, two persons have joined the ranks of the bankers, and one is called John Finn, and the other is Sir Fred Goodwin. I particularly put, because I want you to cast your mind in 2007. 2007, John Fade, brilliant guy, the top of the Harvard Business School, who was the best in the world. At the age of 53, he was made the chairman, the chief executive officer of the New York Stock Exchange. And then, because he did it so very well, when Merrill Lynch went down, October 2007, $6 billion losses, they had nobody other than John Fade. John Fain was brought, no salary, only some, some, some allowances. So, but very soon, they found that he gave himself a salary of $83 million. And on 8th of October 2008, you have seen how he managed. Now, you see, he passed on the buck to Ken Lewis. You know what happened to Ken Lewis Bank of America today? The poor fellow has lost his chairmanship job because he was so powerful. And again, when I mentioned John Fain, it's a, it's a kind of a pain which you, which you mentioned the name of John Finn because he actually is one of the brilliant guys that you will ever come across. 
And when I tell you that he was at one of the youngest heads of the Goldman Sachs now, and he had such clout with even a person called whose name I will come, you will come across, Henry Paulson, who became, became the Treasury Secretary and who was the founder of what you call TARP today, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Sir Fred Goodman is our gentleman who next very close to me, very close to Green, to the Regents Park where I live, and he, he was a very powerful man who in fact saved Barclays Bank from their own uh, misery by taking over ABN Amaro and then committing a 90% deduction to the, to the shareholders' wealth of the Royal Bank of Scotland and got himself a check of six million pounds, very recently, you know. So that is the order of low thing that you have at the moment, you know, because the public is not going to forgive you. Why have we gone wrong? Where have we gone wrong? Yes. Everybody will tell you gross mismanagement of risk, race to the bottom of, that needs explanation. Because I was touring around in 2002, after July 2002, Europe, talking about what is called SOX, carbon oxalate, oxalate, you know, one of the most draconian acts. We will just visit it for a little while. And what was it talking? It talked about everything that you can think of today that needed to be legislated in order to improve things, you know. Why did it not work, you know? Because there was just when the race, there, there was a carbon's oxalate going on. What was happening in the UK? I have very close friends here. Forgive me to say that. But they said, no, we don't believe in our, any action. No. We believe comply or explain. And you have seen the explanation that the Australian gives for stop drinking, you know. So comply and explain. That is why the bezel, which John uh, Galbraith talks about the bezel, which has been undiscovered money, the people are being looted, they do not realize started from a very, very long time. Because there was a race to the bottom. They did not want socks, you know. Socks were there for public consumption, not for using. Excessive leverage, defectors, all these are said. But I'm not going to touch about it. Transparency, bloggers. Bloggers strike back. Where have we gone wrong? There is a culture of profit at all cost. Can we continue with that? And we will talk about it. Winner takes all. Banks spent $370 million to fight rules and donated $2.2 billion in election funds. Why? Because they did not want the regulation to be tight. What everybody's talking about, the World Council for Corporate Governance written raw volumes about this, that things were going wrong from 2007. Because in July 2007, they were accused outside one of the biggest bank in the United Kingdom, the Northern Rock. And there would have been a message right now, but nobody noticed, not even the Financial Services Authority of the United Kingdom. And the excuses that they gave, I've just mentioned to them. Virulent greed, concealment, conceit, and corruption. Not that what I said, Lord Penrose said, when he talked about the equitable building society, the, the equitable insurance society. That is what has been, this culture has been there for a long, long time. How did we get it out? And it was started by the architects of Meltdown. They were the best boys of business school. Richard Fern, the head of Solomon, the, the Lemon Brothers. Henry Paulson, the Treasury Secretary. Why I use the word Henry Paulson? Because it's very critical. And that's what you will see tomorrow's news. Bernal Ken Lewis at the moment, he became, got, went to the doghouse only because this John Thier is very powerful. He managed to get Bank of America to buy Merrill Lynch, you know, and got himself in a, 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 sent them a bill of a bonus of $10 million, got them to pay. But because Ken Lewis didn't, that was a fight. You know. Now there is a lot that is happening. John Thien, Jeffrey Skilling, also one of the best boys of Harvard Business School. Each one of this is a Harvard Business School boy. David Lee, who brought the concept of uh, the uh, financial engineering, what we call the derivative, was also one of the business school. Now, why I mention the business school? Because what is being taught in the schools? Everyone perfects the art of, what is the art of H and TGC? How not to get caught? That's what we are being paid for. We are being paid for how not to get caught. Not how to comply with rules, but how not to get caught. That's what the business schools tell us, because why there's a clamor of transparency? Nothing new, Bay of Pigs. The whole of Cuba 
has been denied to the world because of America, the folly of America, long time ago. Why? Because, again, lack of transparency. Because the issues are never discussed. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon said, you can disobey all the Ten Commandments as long as you will not disobey the Eleventh. Thou shalt not be found out. Can you do that today? In today, 40,000 blogs are coming up every single day. Can you hide? Where will you hide? LTCM, nothing new. 1998, all that has happened today has happened before. It's like Stephen Stember. Stephen Spender, he said, whatever I'm going to tell you has all been said before. But when I said it, nobody listened. So I have to say it again. LTCM did all that. What is happening today? 1998, nobody bothered. Enron did that. Worldcom did that. Iraq war was the result. George Bush, Lord Black. Lord Black had independent director, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger was the independent director of Hollinger, the company which he squeezed the lemon out of it completely and became in the, and went to the jail. My point is, time and time again, we are finding people using the markets for their own screwing up. Ordinary people, challengers, Columbia, contractors, the faults were already there. Nobody bothered, nobody talked about them. Nobody wanted to discuss with them. Nobody wanted to share things transparently. How long we can, we can continue? Hank Paulson, Hank Paulson played golf. Shall I tell you? And I want you to invite your attention to the last article of Condé Nast portfolio. Talks about the whole financial world is owned by Goldman Sachs. Note it, Goldman Sachs, Henry Paulson, Goldman Sachs. John Thain, Goldman Sachs. TARP, Goldman Sachs. Why should the government bail out those incompetent banks who could not create value for their own shareholders or stakeholders? And some of them today will be, you will see, the Advocate General of the United States, they will be prosecuted and the companies, the shareholders' wealth will actually be locked up as a consequence. Damien McBride is the man who sent email talking about people using the blog in order to damage. And you have seen how he damaged the position of Gordon Brown. Plain stupid in organization, very simple organization. Plain stupid is called, but they're very bright, young people. Do you know what they did? The British police recruited them, wanted the head of that to be joined them, and she came out with the whole story that they, she was one. The British police wanted them to become an informant. Satyam is an Indian story, but the one good news about Satyam had the best director, independent. Somebody talked about independent director. They had the best independent directors you can choose. The man who taught corporate governance in Harvard Business School was an independent director who was party to that particular resolution where they wanted the promoter, promoter's son's company to be bought by a, at a price, 10 times the market price. What is corporate governance? Why have we done it? I think the thing lies in the definition. Don't want to go over this. What I want to bring to your notice is whenever you talk about law, nobody likes laws. We like outlaws. That's the thing. Because laws do not trigger compliance. Laws encourage defiance. Talk about yourself, you know. Talk about yourself. If somebody talks to you about law, you will think in a different way. But I'm going to take you to a totally different domain. This was a law. This law talked about everything that you could think of, sweeping legislation. Now see, C and of you were personally responsible for establishing, see, see what is the beautiful law, establishing, designing, and maintaining disclosure to ensure material information is made known to CEO and CFO, evaluating effectiveness, and then presenting each quarterly annual report the conclusions about the effectiveness of the disclosure control. Disclosures, the transparency we talk about, was part of the system. CFO, CEO, personally responsible for disclosing the company's auditors, all significant changes, indicating each quarterly annual report. So what was missing? Satyam, the Indian company, was also one of the companies listed. So why SOX did not work? Could Draco had done better than that? It is difficult to make people understand something when their salary depends on not understanding it. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? 
It is difficult to make people understand something when their salary depends on not understanding it. And that is the answer here. The very accounting firms whose integrity was besmirched profited from SOX. Price Waterhouse, 134% profit. Next year after SOX. KPMG, 109%. ENY, 96%. Deloitte, 78%. We are living in an economy of surprise. UK and US nationalized major banks. Aggressive government profession, everybody's talking about. $2 trillion bailout, a trillion dollar bond, buyout by the treasury. Labor rate has come down to the lowest at the moment. Wall Street becomes crawl street. Zero interest rate, zero inflation. We're living in an economy of surprise because rules of the market have changed. Because of the Forbes 100 class of 1970, none is making money today. Public scrutiny has made the corporation naked. Whatever made you successful in the past won't in future. Because evolution, teenolution, evolution. What is evolution? Women have power. You have power. And teenagers have power. Who are the teenagers? Two billion drivers of wealth in this world are teenagers. Teenagers. People at the age of 13 and 19, they are driving the money. Their priorities are very different from the priority of my generation. What are their priorities? There is a value shift. Knowledge, because this is knowledge. Knowledge is very distinct. You see, if you and I want to share something, we've got 10 glasses, and we want to share in a way both of us get better. Can we do that? If I have four, you have six. If you have six, I have four. Can we do better? But supposing you are from Santa Clara. I am from India, Kolkata. We sit together. We discuss among ourselves. Share knowledge. Think the knowledge when shared together adds much more than that. And the degree of increase in knowledge depends on the diversity of the transacting parties. So bring diversity, bring people from Greece and Latin America and this, put them together, ask them to share. Knowledge is infinitely more, much more than, 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 than could have been conceivable during the, in, the, in, the, in the industrial economy. Knowledge is a fluid, intangible asset, can be transferred at no cost. Its value increases when shared. It cannot be used up. The more you dispense, the greater. Now that's where transparency comes in. Because if you're transparency, then knowledge moves in all directions. You have the knowledge of 134 people around here. Share together. Share together. Think of the increase in knowledge just by the bringing diverse people and sharing it. Value shift from tangible to intangible. Value shift from profits to relationship. From domination to partnership. From structures to processes. Perfecting the known. Now, that's the difference in the knowledge economy. Good old economy, you were perfecting the known. I come from quality environment. No defect, zero defect. Can there be zero defect in the human, humans? No, we are con con continuously moving every single day in every single way. I'm doing better and better, better than previous day. But in order to move in the knowledge economy, you have to move from perfecting the known to imperfectly seizing the unknown. We do not do unknown. All these companies who made money, they did not know. From short-termism to long-termism, growth to sustainability, confrontation to collaboration, shareholders, stakeholders, single bottom line to triple bottom line, we're talking today. That is not only the profits, but also the planet, and also, the, more importantly, the people, the human resource. In the knowledge economy, one thing you must remember, laws trigger defiance. Principles encourage it. So I have changed corporate governance. My corporate governance is we need directors, not independent directors. We need directors of independent mind, not independent directors. Companies have had independent directors. They have all failed. We need diversity in the composition of board. We need democratization of the boardroom. Have you thought of it? Go and become a young independent director. Nobody will listen to you. You will not have a chance. My God, there's 25 people here with 25 years experience. Who are you to tell us how to do things better? So you have no chance. Can you democratize? Dissent is a value enhancer. If you agree with someone, you add no value. Dissent is a new idea. Can you bring a new culture? The dissent is a value enhancer. Dialogue and not monologue. Socratic monologue. I'm coming in a country of Socrates. No. Monologues are in parliament. And if I tell you committees in the parliament have dialogue, you and I sit together. We exchange each other's point of view. You have a point. I have a point. Can we discuss it? Can we find a way out? 
That's the way to do. That's what the boards have to do. And boards are not doing it. Disclosure is a prerequisite of trust. Trust cannot be had without disclosure. Dispersal, what is the purpose? Purpose of a corporate governance, dispersal of authority. Cannot have chairman and CEO in one. Have to have a different people. Cannot just have one man show. Have to have different people. Can disruption, not the status quo. Can I disrupt the system, not status quo. I want to change, 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 and change. Because change is the only thing which is going to bring sharpness, sparkness in the human life, you know. How can I change the system? Think every time how you can change it. Dissemination of not just achievements, but also failures, you know. Dissemination of failures is the key to the success. That's what I'm going to build it today with you. Director development evaluation training, that is the key. Who is looking at that, you know? And delivery is the key, sustainable performance that creates the greatest good for all. We do not want to watch dogs. They will do nothing to the company. We need people who can perform. At the end of the day, they can deliver value to all their stakeholders. Otherwise, they have no business to be in the board. Make ethics the work for your business. I had just been participating in a discussion, and I'm going to give you five examples today how to make money through clean and green agenda. Five examples. Let me do that. Go beyond the bottom line. Brilliant art. Brilliant young man. Nobody's making money from diamonds. I'll give you the name of this company. The man who runs the company is called Eric Gottsberg. Young fellow, what did they do? They found, after seeing blood diamonds, they found if we can get ethical diamonds, conflict zone area, and market it to young people who buy diamonds, and they say this is conflict free, certified ethical diamonds. They have made money in 2008. And like this, who has made money? Marks and Spencer. Marks and Spencer, Stuart Rose. His neck was on the chopping block, 2007. He had people who wanted to buy the thing company, but he spent $300 million on four things. On what he did, fair trade, organic food, carbon neutrality, and he talked about zero waste. He said, just as our sandwiches disappear in your mouth, so does our packaging. Result was one billion pound profit. One billion pound hardcore profit in 2008. Marks and Spencer, Interface Corporation, Interface Corporation of America, they used to manufacture carpets. They stopped doing it. They go to your homes, take your carpet away, put 10% of the material, recycle it, fill it back, $3 billion profit. Fourth company, Bitstone Tires. They do not sell you tires. They hire you tires. You track them. They charge you on the, on the way you use them. They, they come to tires with the company. You don't buy them. You hire them, and they charge you on that basis. They made money. Fifth company, Tata's today. Today, Nano. Where does Nano come from? Nano found a niche. Every car company is losing money. Nano is the only company that is making money because of this. I have today given you five examples. I can give you 50 others if you give me time. Be utterly transparent. People don't want to know. There are seven golden words in your English language. I am sorry, I made a mistake. Can you say that? I am sorry, I made a mistake. If you can say that, you are the winner today because Barack Obama, Demosthenes, and Gandhi had one thing in common. They persevered, and then they made a virtue out of making mistakes. They were all born with tremendous, tremendous handicap. Nine out of 10 surveyed stated they were likely to, very likely, switch from one brand to another if the second brand was associated with a good cause. Do you have a good cause? In a time when reputation can be shattered, by the click of a mouse, withholding information from public is daft, suicidal. Transparency is a competitive differentiator. Lack of, but what is the risk? Because we are born into the DNA of transparency. Our companies won't let us be transparent because they do not know the value. How openness creates, how openness creates a tremendous trust. And trust is not going to be had by Shubh by putting the accounts, Bank of America doing a better accounts, or Citigroup doing that. You have to create trust. And the only way to do that is through this way, not by killing the messenger, which even Welsh did that. Because people who wrote about Jack Welsh, the macho maniac, the man of macho maniac, who became a big word in management language, they said people, when he used to question, when staff would question him, the, the people wrote the way he used to thunder, 
caused me to soil my pants. That's one of his executives. Now, how can you have a person contribute? You know the stories about Antonio General, Eric Schenker. Don't want to go into this, you know. But the realm of, the realm of transparency also is uh, under-policed because even the internet is under-policed. Though we have got 40,000 bloggers coming every day, but there is no policing system. But what is the power of transparency? Power of transparency comes from candor. Candor with which Barack Obama wrote Dreams from My Father. Read that book and see the similarities of that book with another book with Gandhi wrote in 1926, which is called My Experiments with Truth. Because it is a candor which people love to hear from you is the thing from the heart. I already gave you the next examples for the brain. People want to listen to your heart without guile, without concealment. Honesty, frankness, openness, capable of being seen through. If the people see that, they will trust you. But candor requires courage of conviction. You must have courage. Recognition of three truths. What are the three truths? There are three truths. One three truth is one I tell you. What is my CV? Depends on what the job you're offering. I will change my CV depending on the job. Second is I know inside. There is a third, and third is so bad. And that is, that is what the Wall Street has been hiding. The degree of opacity in the Wall Street is a third kind of truth. Nobody wanted to admit it. The good thing in today's meltdown is that third truth has come out, the real truth. Why? Because humanity has so far. We are so powerful. The very realization that there is a problem provides you 90% of the solution. The very realization there is a problem will provide you 90% of the solution. Our greatest glory lies not in never failing. Our greatest glory lies not in never failing, but rising each time we fail. That's what the message has to be. Do we teach that in the business schools? I want to ask you, check your syllabi. Do we teach that? Because a great nation is like a great man. When he makes a mistake, he realizes it. Having realized it, he admits it. Having admitted it, he corrects it. He considers those who point out mistakes as his most benevolent teachers. Speaking the third truth, who said, truth that makes men free is for the most part the truth which men prefer not to hear. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Three heroines, all three women. Look at that. Three heroines, all three women, who became the whistleblowers and, and brought us to a stage we can now recognize the degree of corporate malfeasance that we have been subjected to. Creating a culture, how can we do that? Candor inspires commitment, con confidence, collaboration, creativity, competence, competitiveness. Think about it. Remember, we are never alone. Do, don't do anything you feel embarrassed about. But if you've done it, forget about it. Because think the whole world today, you are everybody. Nobody's alone. We are all naked under the clothes. Defending mistakes is disastrous. Einstein says it is not the mistake that you make which causes any damage. It's the mistake that you make of defending the first mistake. That's what happened in Enron. That's what happened. Every People, all these people did not join top companies to defraud them. They did wrong, but did not have the courage that they did wrong. They did not say, I am sorry, we made a mistake. We have today to recognize that making a mistake is actually the success to, 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 to achieve. That's the only way that you will move your goals forward. Trying to meet Wall Street expectations is tough. Wear your embarrassments like badges of honor, like both Gandhi and Barack Obama has done in dreams from my father and my experiments from truth. Promise of transparency drops transaction costs, reduces organizational politics, evaporates boundaries of class, caste, and creed, democratizes information flow, builds employee morale, inspires commitment, confidence, courage, collaboration, creativity, competence, and improves competitiveness and improves decision making. Crayon's son's advice. I'm going back to, the, to your country. Whoever thinks that he alone is wise, his eloquence, his mind, above the rest, come the unfolding, shows his emptiness. The challenge of virtuous leadership, we have to change our models. Changing the business school fostered melodramatic, macro machiavellian narcissistic image of business leaders to an authentic, humble, compassionate, 
listener and virtuous. Think, think the change. I'm moving from Clinton to Gerald Ford. Harvard historian Orlando Patterson described attending a meeting at the White House in which Ford listened intently and with humility to the points made by a diverse group of experts showing equal respect to those whom he agreed and those whom he disagreed. Never before in human history, business had the power and technology to make so much difference to so many with so much speed in such incredible ways in creating a sustainable wealth through clean and green agenda without endangering humanity's future. Corporate governance is the key to make that happen. But corporate governance without transparency is an odyssey without Odysseus. That does not take me anywhere. Sorry, I made a mistake because this has again been said. So I want to remind you once again of three heroes that I know. Talking to your own Demosthenes, who had such incredible handicaps, he could not speak. Good old days, there used to be two speakers. One was Cicero and other was Demosthenes. When Cicero spoke, everybody said, what a wonderful speech. But when Demosthenes spoke, people said, let's march. Get that fellow Philip. March, can you do that? That will not happen by these lectures. That will happen only by what I will give you, a final story. And that story is of Gandhi. Gandhi went to the UK to study law. With great handicap, he managed to get funds to do. But after he had done the Bharat law, he came to India to have, in to, 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 to have a brief. For six months, he got no brief. Finally, he got a brief with a pedal, very small sum. Gandhi actually then writes, he said the first brief was in a small cost court. I stood up, but my heart sank into my boots. My head was reeling, and I thought the whole court was doing likewise. The judge must have laughed, and the lawyers no doubt enjoyed the spectacle. But I was past seeing anything. I sat down and told the agent I could not conduct the case. Gandhi admitted, and he gave the back money. But then I, Gandhi said, but I then thought about the whole thing in the, that night. I could not sleep. Then I said, but then I persevered, and I persevered, and I persevered. I can now give a certificate to myself that a thoughtless word has neither appeared in my tongue nor through my pen. That is the power of perseverance. That's what we need. Thank you so much for giving me the time.